And that's the truth, nothing but the truth. This world doesn't have a whole lot of anything at all for anybody. But I have chosen another route. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed, even on rainy days. Amen. Let me tell this folks are Baptist around here. A little drop of rain just runs them right off. <laughs> Glad you're here today, so I'm going to brag on you. Praise the Lord. Y'all done good. In fact, I, you done real good because today I got a real good sermon, so they're just going to miss it. We're in Nehemiah, if you remember. We've been looking at the power of influence that God gives us as his children. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed, washed by the blood of the lamb. We're made different. We're made new. And we're left here on the planet with a purpose. And that's to make a difference in the world we live in. We've been dealing with this issue of leadership and how Nehemiah is a great role model for leadership. Uh, as he gets a word from God and gets, a, gets a, a purpose in his heart that God wants to accomplish through his life. And he follows through with that. And so we've looked at him as that model from which we can glean a lot of lessons for our own spiritual life. Because we are, whether we realize it or not, we are called to be leaders for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. We're called to make a difference. I think one of the very first statements we made was we talked about the leadership principles we've been looking at is that leadership is influence. If there's anything that Christians should do, they should be the influencers of the world around them. They influence the, the neighborhood. We influence my family. We influence the church. We, we influence the community, the, the state, the nation, the world. Ultimately, nobody's been a greater influence in the world uh, for, the, for, for, for the righteousness and for greatness than, than the kingdom of God, than the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to get returned to those glory days of being the difference maker in the world. But it starts with individuals. We want something corporately to happen. And it starts with us as individuals realizing that we've been called by God, that there's a call on your life. There's a call on my life to, to, to be what God's called us to be and to fulfill his purposes and plans for our life. And one thing we always tell people when they come to know the Lord or even before they come to know the Lord is that God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose. Well, okay, that's great. Let's find out what it is. And once we discover what it is, how do we get in on it and how do we do it? Well, that's why we've been studying Nehemiah because he really gives us a clear picture of what that is. He's in, he's in Persia modern day Iran, Iraq, and he's serving there. He's, he's been carried away, his whole family and, and country has been carried away captivity into, by the Babylonians first and then overrun by the Medes and Persians. He's probably born in captivity. He's not home in Jerusalem where his heart longs to be. And he's now ascended to the place of pretty much a chief of security and head of security as the cupbearer for the king, one of the chief counsels for the kings in this particular position. So as he's ascended that place, he hears news that Jerusalem, uh, the people are defeated, the people are discouraged. Remember, his brothers come back and he's told them what's been going on. And the walls have, have, have not been rebuilt, even though the temple's been constructed under Ezra 100 years or so before that time. But the place is still in rubbles and the people are defeated and they're discouraged. Remember, we followed the story through. We looked at that first lesson about the making of a leader and how his heart was disturbed by a burden from the Lord and how he responded to the Lord and how he began to pray. In fact, the first lesson had to deal with character and prayer and the importance of prayer. From there, if we followed his life through, we see how he had to deal with the king to get permission and how, how leaders plan. The third message we looked at was once he got to Jerusalem with everything he needed to do the work, he still had to motivate the people to do the work. He didn't take a construction crew with him, all right? The construction crew lived in Jerusalem. It was the people of Jerusalem. And how was he going to motivate those people to do something that hadn't been done? They're defeated, they're discouraged, you know, they're burnt out. How are we going to get those people to do anything? And then we saw the plan come to action and how he motivated those people. And last week we talked about how he organized and how that he had spent that time in preparation and planning. And how do leaders organize? One thing we've seen through this, if you paid real close attention, is these principles of leadership apply to every area of our life. I mean, to my home, to my own particular spiritual journey. They apply there. I can apply those, those truths of the Word of God there. They apply to my relationship to my family and my wife, my children, the church, you know, into your secular jobs. These are biblical principles that are timeless and are the eternal. And we ought to give heed to them because they're, they're effective and they work wherever we are in life because they are the Word of God. Now, one of the first things we mentioned as we looked through this series of messages was, was uh, the, the opposition that came as soon as he got into Jerusalem and the people that opposed him. And we talked about... You know, there's, there's no such thing as an opportunity in your life without opposition against that opportunity that comes. 
So what we're going to look at today as we look at this particular lesson is how do leaders handle opposition? And we'll talk about these different levels of opposition that they had to face, the tactics, the effects, and, and, and the right response to opposition. Because one of the great tests of leadership is how do we deal when opposition comes, when the critics begin to sound their voice? How do you deal with those kind of things? How do you, how do you effectively get through that and, and, and make a difference there? I, I don't know about you. Some people, when they deal with leadership and, and opposition, the first thing they do is panic. You know, some uh, get uptight, some lose their temper, some just blow up, some stress out, some can't sleep, some just worry, some get discouraged, some just give up, you know. Uh, I know when we first started the church 25, 26, 27 years ago, uh, when people would, uh, would you know, we'd, we'd have a plan and we're moving together as a body, someone would pop up, you know, and didn't like what we were doing and uh, they would try to, you know, move against that. Uh, you know, I would, I literally, would, I'd get upset, you know, and I would just freak out and blow up. Amen. Just a hand grenade waiting to go off. Now, I didn't blow up because, a lot of times people blow up because they're just insecure. You know, that, that wasn't the problem. It wasn't insecurity. I, I, I blew up, you know, I, I felt at the moment had a good excuse for it. You know, just it's righteous indignation. I'm doing this for you, Jesus. Can I just whip somebody? <laughs> you know, it'd be so much simpler, Lord, if we just whip somebody. Wouldn't it be all right? You know, we're having a deacon's meeting behind the church, all right? So come meet us all back there. We're going to have fellowship. But, uh, I, I, my real concern, honestly, was, you know, just, man, this was a very delicate thing. It was the beginning stages in those early years of two or three, early four years. It's, it's a real delicate time. Most churches, church starts like that, don't last past the first couple of years. Like 80, 90 percent of them never get past the first few years. They just fold their tent up and quit, quit trying to do it. So, you know, there were those things, and I, you know, want to be protective. But if we look at these three things today, there, there's a biblical way and, a, and an unbiblical way to handle opposition. So I think it's good to look at the tactics that opposition used and from Nehemiah because he lays it out very clearly. And the effects of what they were doing had affected the people's hearts. And the third thing is, what, what is the right way to deal with opposition? Now, look at Nehemiah chapter 4 is where we'll start. We'll be bouncing around through the chapter. It says, now it came about that when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, hey, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? You know, can, can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from dusty rubble, even the burned ones? And Tobiah the Ammonite was near and heard him. He chimes in and says, even what they're building, man, if a fox would jump on it, it'd break down a wall. You know, the stone walls just fall apart. The first tactic of opposition is always ridicule. Let's just ridicule. Let's just laugh at what they're doing. Let's just make fun. And that's pretty much the, the standard of opposition. Many times when people are facing opposition, it's usually the ridiculers that come in, the naysayers, you, you think you're doing, you're going to build. The, I mean, just look at the way they put these things. But ridicule, folks, it's, a, it's an effective tool in opposition, you know, to, to use because a, a lot of us, you know, we're, you know, it's, 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 it, it attacks our, our, you know, our, our importance, our value, our worth, you know, you're saying, well, what I'm doing is not important. You're, you're trying to ridicule what I'm, what I'm all about. And there's some people that, you know, ridiculed for their faith. They, they fall prey right to this real easy and they, and they get discouraged over it. You know, they don't realize there, there's a response to it. It's effective because it does attack, you know, your, what you've placed value upon and your own self-worth in those areas. And it, it, I, I like it says, it says that the motive behind this ridicule was with Sambalat, he says, he was angry and he was ticked off. That's the German translation. He, he's greatly incensed. Now, usually ridicule is a substitute for reason. He didn't have a reason, you know, a real good reason, you know. So he just figured he'd laugh at God's people and laugh, you know, right out off the job. If people can't reason you out of your position, a lot of times they'll just try to ridicule you out of your position. He even used this name calling you these stupid Jews, these feeble Jews, these, these weaklings. They, they're not going to get this done. You know? So he, he's making fun of them. He implies that they have selfish motives. They're, they're just doing this for themselves. Are they going to offer sacrifices? This is really all just about them. So he's, he's kind of overstating the case. I like the way he adds to it. They, they think they're going to rebuild this in a day. Nobody ever said they were going to build a wall in a day. You know, maybe they were afraid they were going to build it in the day because they saw the, the, the passion of the people responding to Nehemiah's motivation. Remember, we dealt with that sermon, how they all said, let's get up and let's get it done. Let, let's do the work. But ridicule starts. And the thing about ridicule, a lot of times it's contagious because not only to start with Sambalat, Sambalat starts ridicule, and then here comes Tobias, and he starts jumping in as well, and he's got his own ridicule. You'll find people, if you'll take a lead in, in being a, the, the ridiculer, that there'll be other ridiculers who will enjoy you. Because, you know, cowards, uh, 
They usually don't do it on their own. The second tactic to opposition is this. They use resistance and it's an organized resistance. Catch this. We built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. And it came about that when Sambalite and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were angry. And, and all of them conspired together. Catch that. They all conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. Now, instead of, in the beginning, you have just a couple of critics and a couple of guys who are mocking. They've gone out and now they've developed this complete resistance. They've built this con- conspiracy. Remember, here's Sambalite. He and the Samaritans, they were to the north. The Arabs, you know, that it mentions here, they're in the south. Tobiah and the Ammonites, they're in the east. And the men of Ashdod, they were in the west. Basically, they put a conspiracy together against Nehemiah and the city that's surrounded on every side, north, south, east, west. I mean, they're completely surrounded. You ever notice, by the way, how negative people tend to gravitate together? You know, it's just, it's just the way they work. Their purpose is only one thing, to stir up trouble, to fight, to resist. And by the way, those kind of people, no matter when you put your foot forward to do a work or to do what God's called you to do, or even in your own personal life or your spiritual life to be what God wants you to be, you'll find these people just pop up everywhere. And it seems that their sole purpose in life is just to be against stuff. No matter what it is, I don't think we ought to do that. No matter what you're going to do, I don't think we ought to do that. I, I, that it has been almost with every everything that we've ever presented from leadership to the church body and in, in, in just in church in general, there's always one or two. That, I don't know. I don't know if we can afford that. Oh, that's just too big. Oh, that can't be done. Oh, we don't. My favorite was this. We, we never did that before. <laughs> now, if you've been around here a long time, you know that we do a lot of stuff we ain't never did before. That's where the fun is. Amen. Out there in the edge of the unknown. Oh, we didn't do it that way. That's not the way we've done it in the past, Pastor. And I just don't think everybody's going to like it. If you, if you change that and we do it different, it's not going to go over well. Nobody asked, Brother Joe, did you really spend some time praying about this? <laughs> it's usually my personal preference. You know, It's not concerned many times for the will of God or is this what God wants or we're going to pray about this with you. Let's, I'm joining hands to see if, let, let's, let's see God's face. You know, th- there's just this resistance. The third tactic they use is, is, uh, is rumor. Now, you'll you'll love this. And Nehemiah said, our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them and put stop to the work. And it came about when the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times, they will come against us from every place where you may turn. Now, the quickest way to spread a rumor is to appeal to people's fears, first of all. You know, just find out something they're afraid of. And then the gist of the rumor is, you know, with them in this situation is, we're going to get you from every side. I mean, we got the Arabs, we got the Samaritans, we got the Ashdodites, and you know, every, everybody, you're surrounded by side, and so you know, we got the, you just, you're going down. We're going to kill you, and we're going, we're going to kill you real good. <laughs> All right, when we finish killing you, you're going to be killed. You're going to be dead. It's going to be over. And here's what's happening. He said, "Now the Jews who lived nearest them came and told us they're going to kill us." <laughs> And they're going to kill us real good. They're going to kill us. And I love this. He said, Nehemiah's like, and they said it 10 times. <laughs> it was kind of like, come on. Okay, I got you the first time. But it's like if you repeat it long enough, you know, it's, I think it was Hitler discovered that if you tell a lie long enough, people are going to start believing it. Now, about every politician since then has kind of adopted that same thing. <laughs> you tell people one thing long enough. It doesn't have to be the truth. Just tell people long enough, you, to be, especially in the culture we live in. Just say something on TV. It doesn't have to be truth, but man, it's over for whoever you said it against. You know? Just say something in the news. Just say something in reports. And, and you destroy people in an instant. But that's the power of rumor. I mean, you know, it, it says they, they came in and first of all, it says the Jews who lived near them is what it talks about. I mean, these are characteristics of rumors. They're usually spread by those who are closest to the enemy. You shouldn't spend your time so near the enemy. You shouldn't spend your time befriending the enemy. You should spend your time being closest to God's people and to God's will and to God's work. These were the Jews outside the city of Jerusalem. They lived near the enemies and they were the ones who were the most negative about everything going on. We're going to die. They're going to kill us. What has happened is if they've listened to this so long, they become infected by it. You can listen to what the Bible calls a bad report so long that you start believing it yourself. 
You can do that in your spiritual life. You say, I'm going to go home with God. I, I, I mean, I, this is where I'm going to start serving the Lord. And all of a sudden, the rumors start, the exaggerations start, the enemy comes out, it won't work, you're going to fail, it's not going to happen. And then you live with that. You start talking to other people who tried it and failed, well, it didn't work for them, so it probably won't work for me. And you start believing those things. The second thing about the characteristic of rumors is they're exaggerated when they're repeated. They told us 10 times. Say it long enough, maybe other people will start believing it. But if you're going to be the influencer, if you're going to be the man or the woman that makes the difference, if you're going to be that kid at school that makes the difference, then you're going to have to hang in there and you're not going to believe lies. If we talk about leadership laws, laws, leaders don't swallow rumors. You might listen to them. You might even chew on them, but you ain't going to swallow them. You're not going to believe them. You're not going to believe the exaggeration because the rumors usually are exaggerations of what's going to happen. So that's the, that's, that's the, the methodology. But look at how it affects people. You look at this and the effect of it is just absolute discouragement. In verse 10, it says people start hearing this stuff. Thus, in due to it said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing. There's much rubbish. We ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. And enemy said they'll not, they'll not know or see until we come in among them and kill them and put a stop to our work. So now what's happened with all the rumors and all the negative and all the naysaying, now people are beginning to believe it and they're repeating it. Whenever you step forward to make a difference, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's in your home, in your job, or just in your personal spiritual walk in life. Whenever you step forward to make the difference, one of Satan's favorite tactics is discouragement. And he may use it by, by this resistance. It may come through the rumors, but however it comes, you know, may through ridicule, but you get discouraged and the enemy begins to have a, a tremendous effect and a terrible toll in your life to keep you from doing and being what God's called you to be. He says here in verse six, he says, you know, so we rebuilt the wall and it reached half its height. Now understand the wall's built halfway. You got this? The wall's built, the, all the openings where the enemy could slip through, those have all been fixed. The gates are being hung and the wall is already halfway up. But what happens? Now everybody's beat up. And now everybody's discouraged. Let me give you a simple insight about discouragement, all right? Because discouragement comes to all of us. And we all deal with it and face it in our, our marriages, our homes, our families, our jobs, even in our churches where we get discouraged. Let me couple, tell you a couple of things about discouragement and what are the causes of discouragement. First, I believe is fatigue. That's an important thing that you need to understand. One, you don't make any decisions when you're tired and when you're discouraged and when you're fatigued. All right, because usually they will be the wrong decision. They're halfway through the mark of getting this wall done and now they're just wore out. You can, you can imagine, I mean, the 52 days of solid work, they're about halfway in the work now. You know, it's, the only thing they're stopping for is, is, is the Lord's day on Shabbat, on, on, on the Sabbath. And the rest of the time they're working and they're working hard, endless hours and they're wore out. And now they're starting in the midst of all this fatigue, you know, it says their, their strength is giving out. And when that happens, you get fatigued. Then you start being more prone to hear what's going, what other people are saying. Another reason for this and, 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 and the effect, a cause of discouragement is frustration. They looked around. Not only they tired, it says there was much, still so much rubble. Still a lot of trash out here. There's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of garbage. There's a lot of wall that is still down on the ground. There's, there's a lot of piles that, that, that seem to be still there. You know, all this was perception, all right? You, you have to be careful what kind of eyes you use and perceive your situation through. All too often, when we're facing difficulty and discouragement, we don't see through the eyes of faith. We don't see, well, this is what God's doing. This is what God's saying, you know? There, there's this, we, we look at things, oh, there's still a lot to be done. Well, yeah, but understand, the piles are half the size they used to be, all right? There's a lot that's been done. Another reason and another point here is the idea of failure. Now they're saying we can't rebuild the wall. They're discouraged. We can't do this. Others have tried. We must be stupid thinking that we could do it. What makes us think we're better than somebody else? Or all that stuff gets into your mind because you're tired, you're fatigued. You know, you're looking around what hadn't been done. Uh, Vince Lombardi, he said this, he said, you know, fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. And it certainly can. If you've ever been in that situation, and then that last painful element of the consequence of discouragement is, you know, or the cause of discouragement is fear. They're saying, here's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, 
we're, we're getting tired. There's still a lot of trash. We can't rebuild the wall and the enemies will attack us. The enemy's going to attack us. We're, going, we're, getting ready, we're getting ready to get hit. We're not going to see it coming. We're just not ready for this. We're going, to, we're going to get hit. What are we going to do? You know, your opposition, spiritual, whatever it might be, always has two goals. One of them is to hinder and the other is to stop. If they can't stop you, they'll hinder you. That's, I mean, think about that in the pure, simplest form of your own personal journey in, in your spiritual life. Say you've come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You face opposition immediately. There's just, there's opposition from the ridiculers. There's opposition from, from spiritual forces. Satan doesn't like the fact you got saved. He couldn't keep you from getting saved. <laughs> so what's he going to try to do now? He's going to try to hinder you in your spiritual walk. And he loves to use this weapon of discouragement. So if he can't, if he can't stop the work, he'll try to hinder the work. How do you deal with that? What's the proper response? How do you take all this into account and make, and make the right kind of decision and, and make the step that needs to be made? Well, I think here it gives us an answer in chapter, in chapter four, verses four and five. The answer is rely on God and pray. Here, look at Nehemiah's prayer. In the middle of all this discouragement, his, the next verses are, hear, O God, our God, how we are despised. Return the reproach on their own heads and give them up for the plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive the iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you for they have demoralized the builders. Now, in, in the, in the uh, English translation of that verse where it says, Here, oh God, you know, uh, how we are despised, there's an exclamation mark. An exclamation mark is given because of this, this is such an emphatic, powerful statement in the original language. Here, oh God, we're despised. I mean, he's a little ticked off. It's just, there's an anger brewing here, but it's that be angry and sin not thing, you know. But he's, he, but he's expressing his anger. When you have anger, how you're supposed to express it, you take it to God. You know, the Bible says you bring all these things to the Father. So here he is, he's taking this to God. He's, he's letting off steam, but he's letting it off in the right place. He's letting it off before God. Now, the first time I read this prayer, let me say it again. Hear, oh, our God, we're despised. Return their reproach on their own heads. Give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Don't forgive their iniquity. Don't let their sin be blotted out before you. They've demoralized your builders. Now, somebody said, Brother Joe, that's pretty hard praying. How can you interpret that prayer of the Old Testament, say perhaps about those prayers in Matthew 5 where it talks about praying for your enemies or in Romans 12? Well, there's a bit of a difference. I think you, I, I want to make note of it here, okay? One is, you know, I think it's important to realize that when Sambalat and Opa, uh, to, to buy and all these guys and their company, you know, began to speak, first and foremost, they're opposing God, all right? This is an opposition, a full frontal attack on, on God's will and God's work being done. The second thing is, God had already pronounced judgment on these people. It's in the book of Joshua, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in Genesis. That God said, you know, that there's going to be judgment if you try to, try to keep the people of God from being the people of God where the people of God are supposed to be. You know, then in, in Joshua, God told Joshua, you know, everywhere your soul foot's place and I'll take care of your enemies. And so Nehemiah is just agreeing with God's prayer. You said you'd deal with the enemies of Jerusalem. So I'm, I'm trusting you to do that. The third thing catch from this is, you know, uh, Nehemiah is praying that simply that God would bring about what God had promised Abraham that he would do. Remember Genesis 12, God told Abraham, whatever nations curse you, I will curse. We've said many times that prayer is really just finding the will of God and agreeing with it. That's really what's happening here. God, you said that these people would oppose you and that you would deal with them. And the fourth thing Nehemiah makes very clear to us that we all ought to remember, no matter who our enemies are, what they are, is that vengeance always belongs to God. God's going to take care of people. God's the final judge. He's going to deal with those who wrong you, wrong his church, wrong his people, wrong his son. God's going to deal with that. But it's not your business to deal with it. It's your business to do what Nehemiah said. God, that's in your hands. I trust you. How do you handle opposition? It's just a matter of prayer. God, I'm putting these people in your hands. You know? And the best thing I can pray for them is that, God, you deal with them. Now, God knows how to deal with them. If these people, God's already pronounced his judgment long before we ever got to this chapter or to this book. Their judgment had already been, been pronounced in earlier, earlier books of, of the Old Testament. So he's just saying, God, you said this, is what you're going to do with them. They're despising what you're doing. They're hindering what you're doing. We're about a great work. This is the city of God. You do what needs to be done. You're in charge there. He didn't go out and take charge himself. He turned it over to the Lord. 
Now, there's a great passage. We've been going through Proverbs. This, this theme is kind of presented in several chapters, but it's most clearly said in, 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 chapter, in Proverbs when it says this. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. That's Proverbs 26, 4. Don't answer a fool. To, you notice that Nehemiah doesn't answer these guys. He talks to the Lord about it. All right? If you're getting ridiculed in your life and being opposed for doing something to the will of God, you don't have to deal with them. Let God deal with people. You don't, have to, you don't have to go out and spend your time because sometimes people can do some foolish things and it becomes foolish for you to be preoccupied with it. I've been suckered into those kind of deals in my life. You probably have too. And it just, it wastes your energy. It wastes your emotional energy. It wastes your strength. It wastes your time. Let God do what needs to be done. Now, if you're being ridiculed for your faith, especially, you know, the Bible says just take it. Just take it, press on, be what God's called to be. And sooner or later, they're going to see the truth that Jesus is Lord. But the greater the opposition more, number one, you need to pray. And number two, the more you need to depend upon God, which is, which is pretty much the, the leadership principle here. You know, when you're ridiculed, don't take it out on people. Talk to God about it. Because it well could be that in the future, those very same people have a redemption that takes place in their life and a regeneration that takes place in their life. And they be the ones who may be at your side standing with you one day. So let God deal with it. That's what Nehemiah does. He hears the, the initial ridicule. He just trusts the Lord with it. He knows it and goes on with God. Best response to their response, to their reactions, is don't respond to it. First verse says, they ridiculed, and it says, then they prayed and they rebuilt the wall. Don't let ridicule stop you from what you're doing. But understand at the same time, respect the opposition. You say, what do you mean? Not respect them in a sense as to honor them, but to realize they're a real threat. They're a real issue, you know. How do we know Nehemiah respected the opposition? He says in verse, when he says in verse 9, but we prayed... And because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. What's that mean? He did the prayerful spiritual thing, but he also did the practical thing. I mean, it's fine to lay in bed at your house at night and say, Lord, protect me and my household. But get up and lock your door. You know, I get up and lock my door and I have a little piece of equipment in the drawer beside my bed. You know, it's it's Hebrew made. So it's biblical. <laughs> it's made in Israel. So, you know, uh, you say, well, I, I just don't believe in that. We'll get you a good bat. Golf club works. But be practical. We're, we're living in, if somebody just storms in my house and starts killing and pillaging and raping, they're dying. Amen. Or I'm going down, protecting my family. You know? That, that, that's not an assault because of your faith, all right? That's another, that's another story. Are you, some of y'all are not sure about this. Well, if you don't know what to do, there's a few of us. I'll give you the phone number. We'll call and shoot them for you. But anyway, <laughs> if we get there in time. But the best thing is at least get you a good bat, all right? But start with prayer. That's, pra that's, that's the spirit. That's what we're, we're supposed to pray. But what he do? He says, we prayed, but we also set up a guard. Now, I love it where it says, catch that verse in, in verse 9. It says, but we prayed. Now, every prayer before this has been Nehemiah praying. But finally, in chapter four, after know how many months, he's been, weeks he's been going and leading these people, now they're getting it themselves. Now they're praying. But that's leadership. That's the power of influence. Say, hey, that, that prayer stuff works for Nehemiah. I think I'll try. Look at the life of Jesus. Remember, he, he would do these miracles and he'd pray and he'd come back and do great things for God. And he'd go pray and he'd come back and do great things for God. And he'd pray and the disciples say, hey, teach us how to pray. You know, real leaders, especially biblical spiritual leaders, will learn how to pray, but they don't pray just shyly and away from everybody. People see them pray, and they realize the importance of prayer. Now, the, the thing is, there's opposition that comes, and it requires a response. When it's a corporate opposition like they're facing, there's a corporate response. We prayed. We're praying together. Now, everybody's praying. You know? Nehemiah have been praying for four chapters. They finally catch up, and now they're starting to pray. Now the whole of God's people pray, and now they pray, and they not only pray, they post a, post a guard. What's the old saying? To be forewarned is to be forearmed. You don't just pray, you're aware. That's what the Bible says, watch and pray. The Bible says guard yourself, be on guard. The human part, you know, post a guard. The spiritual part is trust God. Watch. Is the door locked? <laughs> pray. I'm trusting you, God, in all things. You rely on God, but you're respecting the opposition. You have an enemy. 
He's a real enemy. I think that's what Jude was saying, that not even Michael the archangel would bring a railing accusation against Satan. And not that he loved Satan or that he had, a, he, he had a, a love for Satan, but he did respect him, that he was a powerful being. And he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> There's somebody more powerful than you. The Lord rebuke you. And we can operate in that, that authority. We say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, and I, with, in turn, with the Lord rebuke you. Amen? But the idea is we understand their opposition's real. We don't just ignore it and say, think it goes away. But we have to address and to be ready in all things in our spiritual life, especially. And, that, you know, when it talks about watch and pray, there's temptations that come every day. We need to be on guard. We don't need to get up in the morning and say, okay, just go and do my thing. You, you, be, you need to be aware that Satan sets traps for you. He sets traps for your children. He sets traps for your family. They're all around us all times. We need to be prayerful, and God gives us insight. The Bible says a prudent man foresees the evil and prepares himself. In other words, God gives us insight. He forewarns us and tells us to have, a, have a, a mind that's clear and a mind that's perceptive to the will and the purposes of God, and we'll see those things in front of us. Now, what he also does here, the third response here, is he, he reinforces the weak points. In verse 13, Nehemiah prayed, you know, he relied and posted on God, but posted the, the, the guards. And he said, so I stationed men in the lowest part of the space behind the wall and any exposed place. And I stationed the people and families with their swords, their spears and their bows. What's he doing? He says, wherever it looks like the wall is lower, there might be a little bit of a gap. I want you to reinforce those stations. All right. Now, the wall may only been a couple of feet high for most of the city. Some places getting other higher. He said, wherever the low points are, you're going to reinforce those. So I put people in those places. I took care of where the weakness was. Let me ask you this. The application, I think, is pretty clear. What are the weak parts in your life? Where are the weak spots in your family? Where are the weak spots in your relationship? Where are the weak spots in your business? You know, what are those? You identify those. You look for those. And you're aware that they're there. But that's where you go to work. That's where you station an attentive guard to be on guard. If you know where the weak spots are in your life, then you're, you're not so prone to fall into temptation. It's out there, but now you're on guard. You know, it's like if you're on a diet, you don't go open the refrigerator and stare at the bluebell. Right? You post a guard, shut that door. You know, you're using wisdom. You know, you, you, you know where the weak spot is. I, I can't give in to bluebell. The spirit of bluebell is calling me in Jesus name. No. <laughs> Trust me, I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> you have to realize, though, that this is an important part, that we respect those, those, the opposition, but we're, at the same time, we're making some, some direct decisions about what we're supposed to do. Remember, good leaders know where they're vulnerable and how to reinforce or where to reinforce those areas. I think that's important for knowing as a, as a, a mother and a father where your children's weak spots are and how to reinforce those areas and how to teach them to reinforce those areas and how to be, you know, to live kind of a tactical life, so to say. Well, you realize that, hey, there's a goal out there and it's the glory of God in my life. And I realize Satan wants to destroy and to keep me from reaching that goal. I need to know how he works. I need to know where my weak places are and my strengths are. Nehemiah chapter four, verse 16, he talks about this a little bit farther. And he says here, he says, uh, it came about that from that day on that half of my servants carried on the work while half of them held spears, the shields, the bows and the breastplates and the captains were behind the whole house. And those who were rebuilding the wall, those who carried burdens, these are the workers themselves. They took their, 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 their load with one hand doing the work, other holding a weapon. For the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. And I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is great and it's extensive and we are separated on the wall from one another. Whatever place you hear a trumpet sound, you rally to us there, our God will fight for us. I mean, they're, they're working on the city. They're all spread out around the wall. They couldn't fortify the place. By the way, they didn't have an army. They were the army. This is just a, you know, they're all involved. So Nehemiah says, if we see an enemy attacking at one point, we're going to sound a trumpet. That's where you'll all gather. And that's where we'll fight. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's important in church life, in your ministry life, in your small group ministry life, whatever it is, if you want to grow it and you want to do something for the glory of God, you keep your communication lines open with each other. The people know what's going on. They know how to relate to each other. They know how to stand for each other. Man, Nehemiah turned the entire city into an army camp. Everybody did two things. They worked and carried a weapon. They worked and they were ready. The principle of leadership is pretty simple here. Every time you start building for God, you're, going, you're just asking for a war. And you're asking for a battle. 
Anytime you do something in your spiritual life that says, I'm going to do this for the glory of God, or I'm going to be this for the glory of God, or I'm going to go here for the glory of God, you're asking for a battle. Anytime you start to build a church, you're asking for a battle. Anytime a church starts doing a ministry, it's asking for a battle. So when the, when the enemy comes, though, we realize we keep working until he attacks. We're working, but we're ready and we're prepared at the same time. We're not backing up. The leader in your family, the leader in your job, the leader of your own heart and life, in the goals that God has for your life, you're that person who says, I have to battle and build at the same time. It would be nice just to say there's no opposition, but that's not true. Anytime any of us ever do anything of any great significance in our life, opposition comes. There's going to be those who oppose you. What do you do? You could do, Nehemiah had some alternatives before him. One, he just give up. It's too hard. Uh, you guys are right. Man, everybody's too tired. There's too much trash still here. There's too much rubble here. And man, it's just, you know, there's just no way. And they're going to kill us. Let's just quit. Let's all go home. Or let's just get our weapons and let's do a preemptive strike. <laughs> let's go out there and do a strike. Or we can just be ready and we can build a wall. Just arm ourselves defensively, which is what they did. They were called to build the wall. What did they do? They built the wall. And they were ready to battle at the same time. They stayed at it. I mean, you can spend all your time putting out little fires and dealing with little issues, and you're never going to get anything done. You stay at the task, whatever the task is, whatever the goal's been. That's one thing. I, I've watched a lot of the Olympics this year. I don't know if you've been watching any of it. You know, but it, it, I, I love the Olympics because you see very, very clear-cut you know, situation where somebody has a determined goal, and they have a plan to reach that goal. And no matter what, no matter what the discouragement are, no matter what the pain is, no matter what the heartbreak is, they follow through with the plan to reach the goal. And they enjoy the blessing of that because they did it. In our lives, we, we, there should be, I, I believe, realistic goals that God set before us. But at the same time, there, there, there's an element of the impossible to them because of all the opposition, or the world, the flesh, the devil. But we keep moving forward. Because we have the word of God and we have the will of God. Ne ne Nehemiah's building plan and battle plan kind of worked together. I stationed them here and they worked and they carried weapons. Then he said, I stationed them by families. We saw that earlier when they're building, right? They're building with families. But now he says, I stationed them by families for battle as well. Because who's going to defend your, fa your family more than you are? Nobody. But he said, when you hear the trumpet sound, you bring your family to the fight. We're going to stand together. Everybody's there to benefit and to stand together. I think it's helpful to understand here. You don't have to fight alone. There's some of you here, you're carrying burdens that nobody knows about around you. You have a hard issue you're dealing with your life. You're, it's, it's a difficult thing. You're going, to, hey, we have a prayer line. We have people that are very serious about that prayer. We have people who will stand in line to help other people, to care for other people, to meet needs in other people's lives. That's the beautiful thing about the church of Jesus Christ. People love each other and people, in fact, I don't think I've ever been in a more loving group of people in all my life and years of ministry of being in hundreds of churches, ever seen a group like this out there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe that. What I'm saying is if you're that person, don't struggle alone. You know, don't struggle alone. You don't need to. People love you. People care for you. People help you bear the burden and the Lord will bear the burden as well. Now, the fourth thing he does of the, of the last couple that I'll share with you here, he reassures the people. He goes on to verse 14. When I saw their fear, I rose and I spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest, I, to everybody. What did I say? Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's the great and the awesome God. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. And that's a great speech, amen. Well, he, he's rallying the troops. He lighting a fire under him. He said, don't, don't be afraid of those people. You remember God. God's bigger than those people. He, he's taking the, the important task of leadership. You know, what are we going to do? I, I don't know what we're going to do. Hey, we're going to remember the Lord. We'll do what we know to do, but that's all you can do at some point in your life because there's just some things that only God's going to be able to do. And you can't give up when those times come because they come in your life. There's times you face obstacles and you say, I don't know what to do. I, don't, I just can't do that. Hey, that's when you trust the Lord. But that's the same time you stand up and tell others, we're going to trust the Lord together. I tell you how many times, in, you know, as, as a young man, you know, you get married, you start a family. 
how many discouragements, you know, you face in those, those years of start. And then as you progress in life, you know, you, you, you have a deal that comes along. You say, man, you know, you, you face a, a miscarriage. You know, what, what are you going to say to your wife? You don't have an answer for that. You know? And guys, you know, we like to have an answer for everything, right? Because we think we do know it all. And it just upsets us a little bit and we figure we don't. So bear with us. What do you do? You know? well, what do you say? You say just what he said. Don't be afraid. We're trusting God. You know? It's like Jehovah, Jehoshaphat, the king, when he was surrounded, he said he tore his robe and said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but we're looking to you. Our eyes on you. That's a great response. That's a leadership response. It, it professes and confesses your humanity, but it also confesses and professes your trust and your faith in God who's greater than all these circumstances that you have to deal with in life. Remember the Lord. God, I love it. And when I read it, you think about all these, 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 these war quotes, you know, like, remember the Alamo. Yeah. They did at San Jacinto, didn't they? <laughs> remember the Alamo. You remember in the Spanish-American War, it was called Remember the Maine. In World War I, it was Remember the Lusitania. World War II, it was Remember Pearl Harbor. All those battle cries, remember, remember. But one thing that's interesting about those versus this one, they were all based upon a defeat. Remember the pain, remember the heartache, remember 9-11, you know. Remember that, remember what that's like. But Nehemiah does something unique. He says, remember the Lord. One is looking back to, to a past defeat, where Nehemiah is looking forward to a present and to a future victory. Let's remember the victories in the Lord, amen. He's saying, let's look to the Lord. Let's get our eyes off the opposition. Let's, let's get our eyes on, on, on Christ. I mean, we can focus on the opposition, but that's, that's where we're going to be fearful. That's where we'll be afraid. There's a lot more of them than there are of us. We're not going to focus there. We're going to remember the Lord. Don't be afraid of them. And he says, remember the Lord who's great and awesome. In other words, what do you mean by great? Look at those guys. They ain't so great. What's great? God is great. God is great. But not only is he great, he's awesome. By the way, the, the root word for the word awesome there is the same word for the root word for fear in the Hebrew. All right? In other words, it's good to have a healthy fear of God because he's bigger than everything. He's more vast than anything. He's stronger than anything. He's mightier than anything. He's more powerful than anything. And literally when it talks about fear and the fear of God, it has to do with a righteous, holy respect. The Bible talks about the fear of man. Compare that to the fear of God. Now, the fear of man causes trembling. The fear of God causes courage. So basically, it means I put God in his rightful place. He's high and lifted up. He's the great God. He's awesome. That's a popular term these days, right? You know, God's awesome. That's what Nehemiah is saying. God's awesome. Don't forget, don't forget that. They're, they're not so awesome. Sambalot, he's not awesome. Tobiah, he's not. What's that, guess him, the Arab? He ain't awesome. God's awesome. So we'll remember the Lord. And this is exactly how he's motivating the people. Don't be afraid. Jesus said that, didn't he? John, in John, was it 12? And he said, hey, don't fear him who can kill the body, but you'd be afraid of him who can kill the body and the soul and send it to hell. <laughs> so you want to fear somebody. Don't fear a man. You fear God. Don't listen to the ridicule of people, what they might say and how they might put you in. You better remember to honor the Lord God in your life. You have a healthy respect for God and a healthy reverence for God. And you help people, if you're a leader, to realize that God is bigger than their situation. This is an encouragement we're always giving to each other. Hey, it's difficult. You're, what you're dealing with is tough and it's hard. And I'm, my heart is broken. You have to deal with it. But hey, I want you to know God's going to get you through that. Listen. You know, there's a tremendous high rate among, of suicide among teenagers. And it, a lot of it's because they're so short-sighted they don't have the capacity to look beyond the moment to see, you know, they have a terrible loss in their life. They have a terrible failure in their life. They've had a terrible time. And they think, well, this is it. Life is over. Life is no good. And they just deal with it in the wrong way. And what they need to be told, hey, God's going to get you past all this. And God's going to get you through all this. And on top of that, all you're having to deal with, God's going to use it for your betterment. You're going to be a better woman. You're going to be a better man for this. You're going to be greater. 
God's going to use this for us. And you may think it's a failure moment in your life, but that'll become a diploma for greatness in your life if you'll trust God with this. That's the message we share with the church. That's the message we share with people. The point is that uh, you fear God. If you fear God, you're not going to fear people. And you're not going to fear your situation. So Nehemiah challenges me and says, so fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. Well, I've heard that patriotic speech given a lot of times through history. But you go back to the Word of God, and it's amazing how you find it there. The last principle of this, how you deal with opposition is refuse to quit. Verse 15, it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us about their, the, and God had frustrated their plan. Then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. Listen, we know there's opposition when we start moving forward in our life, goals and dreams. Know there's critics. They'll be ridiculing, rumoring. But you have to realize you keep moving on anyway. You keep pressing on. It's the old thing when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You know, when the tough gets going for the righteous, the righteous keep moving forward. Verse eight of chapter four is they all conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. What's he saying? One, if they can't hinder it, they can't stop it, they're going to hinder it. What do you do? When they try to stop it, when they try to hinder it, you keep working. You keep moving. You keep trusting. You keep believing. You keep confessing God's grace. You don't give in to the pity party. You don't give in to discouragement. And if you have, you ask God to forgive you and you move forward and say, I'm not going to live like this. I'm not going to be defeated like this. This is not where I'm going to live. And if I have to endure this, I'll endure it. But I'm going to do it in victory and I'm going to do it with joy. And I'm going to do it realizing that God's going to work something for my benefit. Much, much as I may despise the moment I'm having to deal with, God's going to use it for his grace and glory in my life. Calvin Coolidge made this great statement. I don't think I could even get the emotion of it, but when I read it, I felt the emotion. Press on. Nothing can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than that unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are the overwhelming power. You take that persistence and you take that determination and you wed it to the heart of Jesus Christ. You know, and your life is in him. In spite of the opposition, like verse 21 said, we continue to work. We continue to move forward. I want you to know with every great work that it's accomplished in your life, opposition comes. You just say, I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. In your marriage. Say a lot of marriages never make it past the fifth, sixth, seventh year. Why? People give up. They get discouraged. They quit. They just bail out. You know, they think it's easier to give up. It's not. It's not. It's more frustrating and more defeating and more harmful for the rest of your life. You face those things. You do what you need to do. You keep pressing on. You stay at it. Nehemiah's out there. He's leading the way. He said in verse 21, we carried the work with half of the Holy Spirit from dawn until the stars appeared. At the time I said to the people, let each man with his servant spend the night within Jerusalem so they can maybe a guard for us by night and a laborer by day. So if you weren't working the work shift, you worked the night shift watching them. And guarding. He said, if you live outside Jerusalem, move inside Jerusalem. We're going to live there together. He said, so verse 23, my brothers, my servants, my men of the guard who follow me, none of us even removed our clothes. But they smelled good. We each took our weapon even to the water. Now, that could be several things. To the toilet or to refreshment, you know. We, had, we were ready for anything that might happen at any given time. But he's there, he's leading the way. Huh? He worked through the night with him. He stood there with him. He set the work pace. What did he do? Leaders always model persistence. They're the last ones to give up. They're the last ones to bail out. It's the, it's the captain of the ship mentality. I'm the last one off if it goes down. I'm the last one out if it goes down. You know? We're not going to stop. We're not going to shut up. We're not going to quit. We're not going to bail out. I'm going to live for Jesus. I don't care what the devil does. I don't care what the world says. I don't care who mocks, who ridicules. Me. I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to do what God's called me to do in my church. I don't care what the world says. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what God told me to in my family, to my husband. I'm, I'm going to love him. I'm going to, to my wife. I love her, whatever it is. And I'm going to stay at it. I'm going to be persistent. What if they don't run? I'm still going to do it. I'm just not going to shut up. I mean, what has, I mean, every one of us deals with this. What has Satan been tempting you with? We even mentioned early in the series about having a plan to read your Bible to any of you. Some of you did that. How, are you still doing it? Or did you give up? We don't give up. 
Where are you at this dream in your, in your job, in your career, in your schooling, whatever it is, in your marriage, in your family, all these things apply to your ministry at church. There's, there's an old legend a long time ago that Satan had a big garage sale. And if it was true, I would know because my mother loved garage sales. She'd probably even gone to the devils. <laughs> but what he had on sale the garage sale was all his tools from his little toolbox on how to defeat people. There was every sin you can name. There was the tool called greed and lust and envy and lying, pride. They were just everywhere. Everything was reasonably priced, but there was one priceless tool in the corner. He just wasn't letting go too easily. It was, it was just, the price was too high. Nobody was buying it. He said, what's that tool that you got priced so high that nobody can afford it? What makes it so valuable? What's the name of that tool? He said, discouragement. Because it's the most effective tool I have. We've all dealt with it, haven't we? We've all faced that one way or another. Young, old, in between. We've dealt with discouragement. And the Lord tells us, you know, that, that we don't want to fall into that trap. That we take heart, that we believe God, that we trust, and we lift up the shield of faith against those fiery darts. When a Christian gets discouraged, that's when they lose that power of influence. That's when they lose their effectiveness. So Satan, still using that tool today. I found this poem years ago, but I thought it was so appropriate. Let me read it to you because it really personifies me in some ways at different times of my life. It says, I want to let go. Y'all been there, right? <laughs> I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and by night for God and the right. I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, tis true. I'm worried and blue. I'm worn out through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, <laughs> but I won't let go. I'll never yield. What? Lie down in the field, surrender my shield? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go. <laughs> but I won't let go. May this be my song. May legions of wrong. God keep me strong so I'll never let go. That's a good word, is it not? I think the ultimate test in dealing with opposition of leaders is this. You know, and I think it's the acid test. It's persistence. We just stay strong. How do we handle it? How do we deal with the opposition? How do we deal with discouragement? How do we deal when people laugh at us? How do you deal with, you know, uh, you know, all those critics out there? Well, when someone said, you know, the secret of success, you simply outlast your critics. Amen. How do you get to be a mighty oak tree? Someone said, well, the mighty oak tree is just a little nut that refused to give up his ground. <laughs> Amen. And out of that, you have the mighty oak tree. Listen, there's nothing the devil won't do to try to stall you and hinder you and keep you from being what God wants you to be and you experiencing the fullness that God has for your life. But you have to come to this place. I'm not going to let go. I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I ain't letting go. I'd like to, but I'm not. I feel it, but I'm not. I'm tempted, but I'm not. I said I was, but I'm not. I wrote my resignation, but I'm not. You know? I had in my mind my speech, I was going to quit, but I didn't. You know? I told her I was fed up, going to tell her I was fed up, but I didn't. I was going to straighten him out, let him know what I, no, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be what God's called me to be. That's where the victory lies in our life. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Maybe this morning you felt.